you guys. It's the movie retrospective time. Now, this one that we're doing today, this is actually going to be, hopefully, I don't know if it's going to be a bonus one, because if you're on our Patreon, you will know that we were supposed to actually do Old Boy this week. Uh, but for some, for whatever reason, like as soon as it came up in the poll, like it wasn't on any streaming services anymore. It used to be on Shutter, and now it's uh, inexplicably gone. So I ordered the DVD, but I didn't know if it would show up in time, you know, for, uh, you know, to record. So I was like, well, let's just back up. We'll do one as a backup just in case. And then if we can, you know, watch it, DVD we can watch Old Boy. Then. A couple weeks. Yeah, I mean, I ordered the place I ordered from yeah. is only like a, in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh. So I was hoping that it would be quick. Yeah. But we About usually have, week. yeah, we usually have to record these like, yeah. you know, a few days uh, prior. So, you know what I mean? So I just said, well, let's do Audrey Rose because, uh, Shudder just added it not too long ago. We just watched it a couple days ago. And it's a movie that I saw a shit ton of times when I was growing up. Uh, I saw the, I saw the trailers for this as a kid, like in the theaters and in the drive-ins. I think it was, uh, what year was this again? It came out in 1977. 77. So yeah. it would have been mostly theaters, I think. Um, and, uh, I remember the trailer scaring the shit out of me. The one, I don't know why. Just, it, there you know, was something like kind of creepy about yeah, it. There was something. It had the voiceover for it, the '77 voiceover, and you and me being eight years old, I really didn't know what what they were talking about. You know what I mean? Yeah, I see what you're saying. And it's just a. I didn't know what reincarnation was. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that's what this is about, you guys. <laughs> right. And I just saw some little girl just fucking screaming and doing bad shit and a fucking spooky voiceover. And I was like, oh, monster movie. Oh, oh shit. I don't want to say movie. that. <laughs> and this was coming on the back of damn The Exorcist and stuff. So yeah. when you watch this movie, you can. it's very plain to see that it's riding on it's trying to be like the exorcist and maybe a little bit like the omen i'm not sure the omen one was out at this time or not yeah it was the omen came out in 1976 so so it came out a year before this of that wave of fucking the the paranormal kind of 70s 70s. yeah like haunted houses possession there was like Uh, all that kind of stuff and so somebody said well hey you know what there hasn't been a movie about um reincarnation and there was evidently a book out just like there was with The Exorcist and Amityville Horror and all that, you know, they would go to the books for inspiration and make it a movie. Uh, but the thing is, though, is, man, come on, reincarnation? <laughs> That's not as scary as fucking demonic possession. Well, yeah. haunting and shit like that. So, it's already a little bit of a stretch. They're trying to make this shit compete with The Exorcist. They did a good job. But still, it's reincarnation. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like this movie does have some creepy elements to it. And I remember it creeping me out when I was a kid. I actually read the book. Uh, The book came out in 1975, the novel. It was written by Frank DeFolitta, who also wrote uh, The Entity. Yeah. Uh, which was based on a true story. Good this movie. one this one is not so much based on a specific true story. I think that Frank F- DeFolita said that he based it... I guess he was reading a book of supposedly real reincarnation stories, and he kind of loosely based this story on a couple of those. So it's sort of, sort of supposed to be based on, like, some quote-unquote nonfiction that he, read, that he wrote. But, um, you know, and the book, he also wrote the uh, screenplay for this. Now, I read the book a very long time ago because, like I said, I was super into all that, like, creepy shit. Like, I loved Haunted House shit. I loved all the, you know, poltergeist, like, real poltergeist stories and real reincarnation and real weird shit type of stuff. So I pretty much burned through, like, all I read Amityville Horror. I read The Exorcist. I read this. I Rosemary's Baby. I read all that kind of shit. So I read, the, I read this when I was probably a young teenager or a preteen. And it did kind of creep me out. The movie is almost identical to uh the book which like i said makes sense because the same guy like wrote the screenplay and everything i think the only thing the book goes more into is uh you know one of the characters kind of like where they learned the reincarnation jazz like them going over to india and all that kind of stuff which they kind of skate over in the movie a little bit you know but um in the book they go a lot more into it so this was actually directed by 
Robert Wise. Now, if you don't know who Robert Wise is, I'm most familiar with him because he directed probably one of my favorite horror movies of all time, The Haunting from 1963. He also uh, directed Star Trek, the motion picture uh, from 1979. And uh, he did some shit back in the fucking 50s, too. He did The Day the Earth Stood Still. Uh, he did West Side Story. He did Sound of Music. So he's had like Oscars and shit like that. Yeah, um, that's another thing is, is that one good thing about this movie is that if you like The Exorcist and you like The Omen and those classics, you will like this movie. It's not as scary as the other ones, but it is a high-budget, well-made movie, good cast, real good acting. It It's on par with The Exorcist and, and, and The Omen in terms of quality. Although so. I don't know if I call because like I said, I remember seeing it a bunch of times when I was a kid and I remember it being like really creepy and scary and stuff. And it's not, I don't even know like now, like watching it nowadays as an adult, I don't even know if I would call it a horror movie. No, exactly. It, it has some horror elements yeah. to it. It's like a supernatural the, paranormal movie. It's a paranormal, paranormal supernatural drama. Yeah. I guess you would call it. Yeah. Um, I was actually watching a review of it earlier. And the guy said, um, you know, the kind of recent movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, which was kind of, uh, you know, very loosely based on what well, that was based on Annalise McCall, wasn't it? Yeah. That, it OK, so um, where they were kind of where it was kind of based on the true story of like they were trying to prove in a courtroom that this woman was actually possessed by the devil and not yeah. that she. Had. So um, that's the weird thing. About so it's kind of like yeah. the, a similar kind of thing to this. It's very strange because it seems like it starts out yeah. as sort of like a psychological thriller drama type of thing. And it becomes a court drama. And then it kind of turns into a courtroom drama. Yeah, so it's like, like it's really, really odd. It is odd. It's it a is. very odd movie. It is odd. But like I was saying, that you hate it tonally and production quality. It was on par with the other greats. You could tell it's not one of the greats because it just didn't have it them. It wasn't quite as compelling as demonic possession. It's hard to compete with that. Well, the premise isn't quite as scary. It's, I mean, the premise is not as scary. Reincarnation. I've read like some stories of. I don't believe in it, but I mean, I've read some stories about it, and I'm like, ooh, that's creepy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, in, in a way that, like, where you have a kid and they're saying like creepy shit, like, I when did yeah. I when I died and all this. Okay, that's creepy. Yeah. Um. So it is like a little bit of a creepy premise, but like you said, it's not as creepy as. Yeah. The devil. They obviously. try to really make it as creepy as the devil, though. <laughs> they do. You know what I mean? And it's got old what's his name from the Elephant Man in it and everything, and he helps. What's his name? Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins. This was actually a very very early role yeah. for him. He's very young at this. Yeah. So it he's he kind of brings a certain amount of gravitas to this movie. He's a young Hopkins, but he's that dude was. He, he's always fucking playing himself in every fucking movie. You can say he's a great actor. <laughs> that motherfucker's always playing himself, really. I mean, he's got two modes. Playing himself or he's playing Hannibal Lecter. Because <laughs> we're hoping he's not really Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. But no, I, he, he's a good actor. He's a real he good is, actor. Yeah. And he classes up the joint. You know, oh, yeah, big time. That's what, that's what his job is. If you have kind of a second or third rate move, pro, movie going on, in terms of budget or whatever, you can bring in Anthony Hopkins and he'll class it up a lot. You know, he will. <laughs> he'll fix it. You know? He'll fix it. Yeah. He'll come in here and be like, you know, let, he, let me handle this. Yeah, he'll, he'll, he'll give the movie... smooth over the rough edges. He'll give, he gives give the movies <laughs> credibilities. You know, he, he, sure. You know, uh, he, he'll give a movie credibility. And uh, what's kind of cool is when he, first, when he first shows up in this movie... They kind of use him a little bit as like a red herring. Is this some kind of fucking pervert stalking this little girl? Was we? Is this? Did he have some kind of a sexual motive? You know, and the parents are fucking tripping out. And I like that angle because you're not really sure what the fuck is going on. Is this? You know, you're seeing a a, a movie about reincarnation. So yeah, because that was in the trailer on the poster and everything. It really is his reincarnated daughter, or at least he believes that. You know what I mean? But the, the parents don't know that. They don't believe that. They think the dude's just a yeah, perv. Yeah, because why would you? They think the dude's a perv. You know what I mean? It's a, I mean, it's, I can see good. this playing out a lot differently nowadays. Oh, nowadays <laughs> you'd get your ass shot off. You'd get your ass shot off. Especially, especially in the South. To be but, honest, I kind of feel like now I'm kind of intrigued by the premise of what if, because like I said, I'm not worried about spoiling the movie because it came out in 1977, for Christ's sake. If you haven't seen it, I'm sorry, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, get with the program. But uh, you know what I mean? But the thing about it, 
So the premise of this movie basically is that reincarnation is real. It's yeah. almost kind of like trying to convince you that it's real. It's yeah. almost kind of like a polemic in that yeah. way, which yeah. is a little weird. But I'm kind of, now that I'm thinking about it, now I'm kind of intrigued with the premise yeah. of what if the, you know, the uh, premise of the movie was that reincarnation wasn't real but this dude actually really believed it. And then they left it kind of ambiguous. It's like, how would you deal with that? Like this one person, like really, really believing yeah. that your kid was their kid and all this other kind of stuff, like how that would play out. Yeah. Anthony Hopkins got some great scenes in this movie about reincarnation where he tells his story and he educates you on fucking reincarnation about his travels all around the world. And then he goes to India to go fucking study from the great Maharishis and or whatever, you know, what do they call them? Do you remember? Oh shit, I can't even remember. He wasn't a Maharishi, I made that shit up. <laughs> but study from these great fucking spiritual masters who fucking proved to him, you know, that yes. And it was almost, it almost became like a little bit of a documentary about India there for a bit. Yeah, they when, had some like kind of yeah, stock footage there of yeah, like some funeral pyres and stuff. Funeral pyres and... and stuff, you know, trying to trip you out about India. Cause you know, if you were just a regular American, well, back then that back was very exotic days, knowledge. Like, oh, India! Now everybody knows about that. Guy, we got Indians living across the street. Well, that's what I mean. It's yeah. like it's nowadays. They got Netflix. Nowadays, everybody knows what reincarnation is. But like <laughs> yeah. in the seventies, right. they kind of had to explain everything paranormal because it was yeah. like new to people, I guess. Like you yeah. know, or it was new to like mainstream audiences, I suppose. Yeah. So all right, so let's kind of talk about the how the story of this goes. Okay. So we have uh, a couple. Uh, very upper middle class. Uh, these really, really nice. Uh, I'm gonna say that those fuckers were filthy rich. Did well, it seemed like living? yeah, that man. And they lived in Manhattan. In Manhattan, for Manhattan living like that. You, we, I was calling. We were both calling bullshit on that. Well, the dude was like a Madison Avenue like ad executive, which I guess okay. Maybe you could do, you could yeah, make a lot guess, of money, and I don't I think it was could. quite as expensive in Manhattan. Yeah. I mean, it was still expensive. So obviously. basically, he's a Ma he's he's Manhattan's version nowadays, of Darren could, Stevens. Nowadays, they could probably get thirty mil for that fucking apartment yeah. they lived in. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a real building, so you could actually look up apartments in there like nowadays and see. We could look it up on Zillow or something and see how much it costs. I'm sure it's at least that was that million. was back in that's the, a, that was a massive place. That shit was back in the highly centralized economy where if you worked for a certain film, worked work for a certain firm, your fucking your little shyster ass could make a millions of dollars a year just making commercial jingles and shit like that. Not anymore. Nowadays, you'd be working on YouTube. <laughs> That's what yeah but it was like this that. massive apartment like then, I, I yeah. don't know if it looks like this anymore but it had yeah. like all one of the things and it was even kind of a plot point in the movie yeah. was that it has like all these paintings and shit on the ceiling which was real they didn't add that to the movie but this is like a real building i can't remember what the name of it was that's like pissed me off but um but yeah so you have this couple uh and the dude uh john beck plays the dad um and Mar Marsha Mason plays the mom. It was bugging me the whole time because I know I've seen John Beck in other movies and I was just like, God damn it, where the fuck have I seen him? And I looked and I looked at his IMDb and he has like this massive fucking list, but I couldn't think of anything. Like there was nothing on there that I would have been so familiar with that I would have recognized him from. So I don't know. He's been like on a ton of TV shows and shit and like, you know, over the years. But anyway, so he plays the dad in this and they, uh, this couple have a daughter who's about to turn 11, I think, named Ivy. And she's played by Susan Swift, who I think this was her first role. She didn't really go that much into acting. She was in a couple other things, like, you know, some TV and movie after this, and then went off and did other shit. Yeah, and in this point of the movie, the movie's really feeling a lot like The Exorcist. Yeah, you yeah. You got the rich couple, and they got the daughter. And, and weird shit's happening. Yeah, and they're and like, you know, doing family shit and like, you know, yeah. planning her birthday and, and all that kind of stuff. You're already going like, man, is this a rip off of The Exorcist? But then the plot thickens. <laughs> the plot thickens. Yes. So yeah, very shortly into the movie, they start to notice very creepy bearded uh, Anthony Hopkins kind of skulking around. Yeah, looking and peeking in people's windows and shit. <laughs> Well, not, well, he's not quite peeking at people. Well, he's showing up to her school. But he is kind of like hanging out in front of the school. Hang, hang, like I said, you do that nowadays yeah. and someone's going to shoot shot. your face off yeah. because they're like, why are you even hanging out here? Your kid doesn't even go here. Yeah. Um, Get away from here, pervert. And then you would have to be like, you yeah. know what I mean? They, they'd have to put you on a registry somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but like, but back in 1977, it was, they still thought it was creepy, but it wasn't like, call the cops kind of creepy. They did call the cops later, but. They called the cops after they talked to him. 
Yeah, because so the thing is, they start noticing the dude and it's not just him like hanging out by the school or whatever. He's also like kind of following all of them around. Like he's kind of following like you see the dad like on the bus or the train or whatever, or the subway. And, you know, he looks behind and there's the fucking dude again. It's like, man, this fucking dude is everywhere. What the fuck? So finally, they they call the cops and the cops are like, well, um, you know, did he hit you? Did he do anything? It's like, you know, he's just standing on the sidewalk. He's not doing anything against the law. You know, they didn't have stalking laws back then in the 70s, in case you didn't uh, know that. Maybe some states did. Yeah, I, I kind of... state. Yeah, I do kind of feel like that's like a newer yeah, kind things, of shit, though. Things went in and out. You know, those talk shows had a lot to do with fucking new laws coming. A raw yeah. and shit. That's true. Yeah. That's when people started to really understand what serial killers were. Yeah, because really, early I mean, like I said, people didn't really have a concept yeah. of serial killer until the like, 70s, even though they, well, obviously, they, obviously there were serial killers before that, yeah. like fucking Jack the Ripper and H.H. H. Holmes and shit like that. But wasn't in the modern Bell Gunness wasn't in the modern imagination. Yeah, it just it wasn't really that much of a thing. I remember the first time I heard about him as a little kid. It sounded like something that was made up. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? Sadly, like, no, no. that doesn't happen. You know what I mean? Sadly, no. But I think adults kind of thought that, too, like that. that that, that couldn't have happened. That can't happen. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Little did we know. Yeah. But yeah, so finally they, like I said, they go to the cops and the cops are like, shit, man, we can't really do anything. There's no law that says, you know, dude can't stand on a public street. So, you know, if he hits you, come back to us. So finally, after all this time, this dude's like skulking around, like I said, and then finally he approaches them and he's like, man, I, you know, I need to talk to you and all this other kind of shit. Now, at first they're reluctant. And a lot of the story too, like a lot of the conflict comes from Marsha Mason's character, the mom, and she kind of, um, Janice is her name, Janice Templeton. And, uh, she kind of wants to hear the dude out, or at least she kind of wants to know what the fuck are you doing? Why you keep hanging around, like watching my kid. Whereas Bill Templeton, probably he just kind of just wants to punch the dude in the throat and he's like just sick of hearing about it. But finally they agree because the dude just will not leave them alone. And they so finally they're like, all right, fine, we'll meet you at this restaurant. Just like, please just tell us what you want. And, you know, what the fuck? So they all meet at this restaurant and in this very, very long scene, probably a, long, a longer scene than it needed to be. But Anthony Hopkins um, says to them that, I say his name's Elliot Hoover in the movie, but I'm just yeah. going to call him Anthony Hopkins. It's easier to just call, <laughs> explain himself. That's who he is. Yeah. It's Anthony Hopkins. So he tells this story. He's like, basically, um, 10, 10, 11 years ago, uh, my wife and my daughter, Audrey Rose, were killed in a horrible car accident. Like the car flipped over and it burned to death, which is, yeah, one, showed it which is one of the first things. So I think that's yeah. like the first scene first of the movie. The show, yeah. And then, like, this little girl, like, at the window they with, like, all the fire. They bang, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Before they kind of yeah. get into this kind of... Right. Yeah. So he basically explains that happening. And then he kind of gets into... It takes him a while. He's kind of, like, beating around a bush a little bit, dancing around the subject or whatever. But basically, he's like, yeah, I've been all around the world, and I went to India, and I studied with this, that, and the other person. And I basically... Went to these psychics, he says that too, which, yeah. like I said, I'm not sure how good that is for your credibility, but yeah. whatever. He's like, so I had that these two psychics. That was before Psychic Friends Network. So yeah, before it, everybody it, knew that psychics were it, bullshit. Yeah, it, it, it hadn't been <laughs> tarnished yet. So, like, although some, some psychics yeah. told you some, that was, like, some serious yeah. shit, man. It's like, but he, although, but he was... I'm going to clean that up, though. <laughs> you got to clean that up. Yeah, corporate psychics and shit, you know what I mean? And telepsychics is about, like, televangelists. I do believe that there are people that fucking have pre I've fucking had, dreamt true had precognition fucking of course poltergeist stuff that happened so that's all related to some people would call psionics but I think everybody has it to a certain extent or another so and I don't know if it's necessarily controllable no, I, I think it just kind of like comes is. and goes like yeah. without any rhyme or reason something having to do with the unconscious it's it's an yeah. animal part of you it's not a rational part of you it's doing it which, because which leads me to believe that could be that animals may have it. we call it instinct yeah you know what i mean it's just like a sharpened instinct it's is like kind of instinct. how i right. how i think of it and like think... maybe some people's instinct is sharper than others yeah who knows what whales are doing i mean they're communicating across vast distances but uh, they're some... plotting to take over the world is right there now well no i mean is there something kind of like telepathy happening yeah too along sure. with those sounds you know, is it, is, are those sounds being converted into a mental image inside the mind of that damn whale, like a television signal would? That's some heavy-duty shit. You didn't think of that, did it? 
Well, I've thought of similar things to that. So. What if it was just like, yeah, what if it's just a signal like ra like radio? Yeah. And it goes in and he's seeing an image in his mind. That'd be weird. Okay, it, well, it would be know, weird. Getting off the getting off subject. <laughs> no, not yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah. So basically, he finally gets around to. He's like, these psychics told me that my daughter Audrey Rose, who kill who was killed when she was five, is still alive. So that was kind of the big thing where the psychics were referring to her as if she were alive, and were very surprised when he told her when he when he told them that she was dead and they were like no no she's alive and she lives in new york city and she lives in this apartment with paintings on the ceiling and he said two separate psychics told me the same thing and i spent all these years doing all this research and i have determined that your daughter ivy uh is the reincarnation of my daughter audrey rose so basically the rest of the movie is him trying to convince the two of them that ivy is the reincarnation of his daughter, like pointing out, you know, the shit that the psychic said, pointing out that Ivy was born like pretty much two minutes after um, Audrey Rose was killed in the car accident. And then there's other shit too, like they kind of go into, the parents are saying that every time Ivy's birthday rolls around, um, she starts having night terrors where it seems that she kind of gets up and starts sleepwalking and starts slapping on all the walls and the windows and starts screaming and freaking out. And they can't, um, you know, they, they can't like get her to stop doing that. And she just like does it every year and it's getting worse and worse. Now it's so happy. They don't really believe him obviously, because they're just like, whatever freak, just like get the way the hell away from our kids. Or we're calling the cops. But as time goes on, like, because in the, movie ivy's birthday is approaching and she starts having these night terrors again and then something happens where she has one of those and she's like running around her room screaming and she touches a window and it's like winter outside or whatever and her hands burn like yeah. on this cold window which seems to convince the mom okay there must be some like supernatural shit going on here and another thing too is that when uh anthony hopkins comes over and starts calling her audrey rose and saying daddy's here daddy's here she calms down like immediately so the mom becomes convinced that okay maybe there's something to this but the dad is not having it he just doesn't want to know he's like this big skeptic just like in all these kind of paranormal movies you always have to have like the dude being like no yeah but then the wife's true believer from the fucking from the outset well, she doesn't buy it at first either, because yeah. I kind of think she just thinks the dude's a creep. They always see the ghost first. And then but they... then, I know, it's just like every single episode <laughs> of a haunting. Like, they're like, you don't know what you saw. Women don't know what they see. Women don't know how Women senses don't... work. Women don't know how reality it's works. True. It's true. Yeah. We don't know Women anything. Women don't know what they're seeing. I don't even know how I, like, walk around yeah. during the day. Women because... don't walk. <laughs> We don't know how anything we works. Don't know how to walk. <laughs> I, don't even, I should just like lay around yeah. like a fucking slug and figure it out. Yeah. But yeah, so there's all of this kind of um, conflict about it. And it's like, you know, Anthony Hopkins keeps coming over like every time she has one of these night terrors and he seems to be the only one that can fix it. And basically he tells her, like the reason that she's running around the room like that and that her hands burned on the window and stuff is that's what happened to my daughter. Like she was trapped in the car and the car caught fire and she burned alive. And, you know, a witness said that they saw the little girl like, you know, yelling daddy, 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 like on the window, like she, while she burned to death, which is pretty horrifying. But yeah, so as, so as the time goes on, um, it shit starts to kind of ramp up. And at one point, Anthony Hopkins makes the perhaps um, rather unfortunate decision. He uh, he rents an apartment in the same building as them, and he straight up kidnaps Ivy like one night after one of her <coughs> night terrors. He kind of puts her to bed, and then he's like, "Oop, pull up, I'm out," and he takes her and he takes her. But the stupid thing is like. They, they find her, like, immediately because they go down to the doorman. And they're like, oh, yeah, that dude, like, totally rented an apartment here, like, just a couple days ago where he was, like, setting it up. So they just, you know, obviously the parents, like, just call the cops and they go up there and, uh, you know, they're like, yeah, she's right here. So then they arrest him, obviously, because that's kidnapping. And at that point, uh, it goes into the, uh, you know, courtroom drama sort of portion of the film. And after that, so basically they're they're arguing... The thing about it that's interesting is that in the courtroom, they're actually arguing. They're not arguing over whether Anthony Hopkins actually believes that his daughter is the re is, you know, that Ivy is the reincarnation of his daughter. 
Um, which seems like that would be much easier to prove. They're actually trying to prove that she really is the real. So they're trying to prove in a courtroom that reincarnation is real. Yes, it's it's the bizarre part of the movie. It is very that. weird. Tr- it's so, a very strange, like, tonal shift. Yes. Not a tonal shift, not a big time one, but it is kind of like it an, odd, and it, it, when it an happens, odd tangent. When it happens, now that you mentioned the movie, The Entity, I really see a lot of The Entity style. Yeah, same movie. writer. Yeah, there, there's a lot of that in here. Because the entity was like that, too. It started off as them, poltergeist raping this woman. Yeah, and then it ended up real. shifting very quickly, kind of like into a scientific thing. Let's catch this poltergeist. That's right. I had totally forgotten Remember about that? that. Yeah. Yeah, let's catch this poltergeist. And they had a damn fucking big freezing chamber and they even made like yeah, a that's right. of her house that's right. that one again i know that was like that was a weird ass movie too yeah, now that i'm thinking weird. about it i think and i read that a, book too there was, was a tonal shift when it went from paranormal into like science yeah let's catch the damn ghost we're gonna have it's gonna be yeah. like a frozen that's ghost like frozen. a ghost sickle yeah, freeze it yeah it was pretty, <laughs> it was pretty, and this one's kind of like that it is now that you mention it yeah it does actually go kind of from a sort of like creepy thriller yeah. with some paranormal overtones into like a courtroom drama where it seems like they're really scientifically or yeah. fringe science they're, anyway. They're trying to convince you, the audience. Yeah. Of, of, that reincarnation, of reincarnation is real. real yeah. So yeah. So basically they're, they're just yeah. like, you know, passionately arguing in the courtroom that it's like, yeah, and, you know, the reincarnation is real. And you know, what else is weird is that I guess it infers that he's trying to argue that the child is his. Is see, he trying this, to get custody? See, this is what's weird to me. It's like I'm not really. It was not really that clear. Was well, it? he well he was on trial big for kidnapping. Okay, so they were right, basically just trying to get him. Oh, they're trying they to get, were, they yeah, trying to get right, him off right, for yeah, the yeah, kidnapping that's charge. Right, that's right. He right. wasn't trying to like you yeah, know get right. custody. That's basically, right. he told the parents he's like all I want is to like be in her life and stuff like yeah. that because she's he's got to have rights technically. Yeah, because rights. she's technically my daughter. Which, yeah. like I said, if a dude actually like approaches that, that's like pretty scary. That's like a it creepy. Would never happen in real life. No, I know, sure. but I'm just like if that you know if somebody did come at you like that. Yeah. It's like you would have that person in prison like yeah. in five fucking seconds. But but I feel like in the movie. They want you to sympathize with him, even though yeah. he's creepy, because, like I said, in the universe of the movie, reincarnation is real, and he's absolutely right that his daughter has been reincarnated as Ivy Templeton. The crazy thing about this, though, I'm not, okay, so I'm not super clear. I'm not, like, an expert on reincarnation or anything, obviously. So I think the whole thing is that he keeps telling the parents, or mostly the mom, because the dad's like, fuck you, I'm not listening to you anymore. You think he even punches him in the face at one point. But he's just kind of like, we have to work together because um, Andre Rose's soul was taken too soon or something. Um, And then now she's trapped in Ivy's body. And if we don't do something like she'll die. But then, okay, but then I don't, I didn't, I wasn't real clear on that. But then the weird thing about it is that in the last part of the movie, like after they do the courtroom stuff and then the judge and everything were like, well, let's hypnotize her and then we'll take her through past life regression, which was a big thing in the 70s. Like we'll hypnotize you and then take you back to your previous lives because people like a lot of people believe that stuff. So they do that. And then the the hypnotist guy who's supposed to be like the the leader in the field or whatever. And he's like, oh, I totally know what I'm doing. It's totally safe. It's fine. You know, the little girl will be totally fine. And he regresses her back to when she was Andre Rose. And she relives the whole fucking accident. And she fucking burns to death. Like, or burns to death or dies of suffocation or however she died in real life. So she dies in the room, like where they're being hypnotized. Because the hypnotist... He regresses her back to when she was Audrey Rose, but he still keeps calling her Ivy to get her to wake up. And Anthony Hopkins is out in the fucking room being like, she's not Ivy anymore. Call her by her fucking name. And the yeah. hypnotist is too dumb to figure that I out. Forgot about that. So, so yeah. So um, Anthony Hopkins like picks up a chair and like busts open the glass. Cause they're all like in a, yeah. you know, in another room or whatever, yeah. but then it's like too late. All so, scientific and shit. Yeah. So Ivy dies at the end. Yeah. And then the weird thing about that is there's this little coda of the movie, right? where the mom, Marsha Mason, she's like writing a letter because I guess Anthony Hopkins is fucked off back to India because he just wants to hang out with them. She's and talk she, to her into the spirit realm. Yeah, and and she is like, well, you know, I believe you and like, you know, our, our daughter's soul is free now. And it's like she's sending, she gave 
Ivy's ashes to him and he's going to scatter them in India so that her soul would be released and she could find like her next body or whatever. And I was like, oh, and now this, now this couple, Marsha Mason and John Beck are going to like go around the world looking for where their daughter turns up next. It's like that, th if that was true, that could slowly turn into a huge clusterfuck for everyone involved. But I didn't really get why, I didn't get why it was dangerous for mm -hmm. Ivy to have Audrey, because presumably if Audrey Rose was killed and her soul found another body, like pretty much immediately, um... Why, like, why wasn't it just all cool? You know what I mean? Like, why would Ivy have died? But then Ivy died anyway. So I didn't really, like, when they tried to hypnotize her, so I don't really, they but she's needed, free they, now. It probably just needed a dramatic end to the damn movie. That's probably Maybe. Cool. I don't know. It just seemed like a weird, I'm, like I said, I'm not real up on reincarnation, so I didn't really know what they were getting at or why, like, what would have happened if they hadn't intervened? You know what I'm saying? I don't know. And it did seem like Anthony Hopkins was trying to get custody of the girl because he took her. I'm not, I didn't really take that part of the movie seriously. You know what I mean? I well, just, yeah. I just took the movie. The movie as, takes itself very yeah, seriously. Yeah, I just took though. it as kind of like a wannabe horror movie that ended up being more like a courtroom drama with some paranormal stuff in it. Yeah. And um, as far as the mechanisms of how the reincarnation works... What they're showing is a very pedestrian concept of how it would work. Yeah. I've had NDE and out-of-body experiences and stuff, and Stuart Hameroff will tell you that there are certain things, in certain things about quantum consciousness to where reincarnation, and he doesn't quite say reincarnation, it's just paranormal stuff that you hear about could be very plausible, that the consciousness, you know, would survive, survive the death of the brain. Because it's quantum entangled particles, and it could re-inhabit another body. All right. The thing is, though, is you're 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 assuming that I'm gonna just call it a soul. When a quantum soul leaves the body, that it when it reincarnates, it comes back down to continue where it left off in time space. No, the uh, I guess you would say the spirit realm is outside of time and space. So the next life might be in the past of the last life. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So in other words, like you might be reborn, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're reborn as a human. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're reborn the next day after you died in the last life. You might be reborn, you know, 20,000 BC might be the next life. Yeah. Because you're restarting, you're re-entering into the damn time space every time. So you're re-entering time space at the location and time that you choose at that point time it could be in the past or present or future depending compared you know what i mean in in in, in relation to the last life you you, you had yeah this one brought with you this one seems a lot more straightforward in brought. the sense that that was one of the things that was that it's a linear brought progression. yeah that it was like brought us you know because yeah. because she was born like yeah two minutes two like minutes after, after the girl yeah, died yeah no, that doesn't that, that that doesn't jive really with the concept of fucking... But like I said, I remember a lot of reincarnation yeah. stories that, that came out in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And it's like, and then... That's folklore. Well, yeah. And that's yeah. kind of what this is based on. I will say it's... This also, is... What? But also the concept that you might remember your past life, you can disprove that by saying you don't remember... Nobody remembers their past lives. I and pretty much every you, story... And like I said, I don't sense. I don't believe in reincarnation, but yeah. it's like every story I've heard about that where people said, yeah, my kid said this weird thing and they yeah. found out that it was a real person that died like before they were born and blah, blah, blah. But it's like that it always seems to fade away once they're over about five years old. Yeah, so. this like they don't remember shit anymore. This is something... This is... Okay, you, now you got me into a good subject. My dad told me that when I was a little kid, I would tell stories of me and him on a tractor falling off the damn tractor. But that didn't happen to me and him. It happened to my dad and his dad. Yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah. All right. But he said I remembered it at about five. But the thing is, is that necessarily, that's not necessarily supernatural. It could have just been a memory that was inherited genetically. Yeah. You know what I mean? Animals may, animals and insects might inherit some memory. Because they seem to come out and know shit. Without much, without much education, especially insects. Yeah. You know? So it might be that 
humans might be born with like little <clears throat> vestigial memories from their ancestors. It, I think it might be plausible, but they're written over and erased as you gain your own experience. Yeah. Yeah, you know I mean, because which is why people why, why which is why when you hear people that come up with that kind of reincarnation sounding shit, it's always when they're a little kid. When they're a little kid, yeah. And like it, once they're five or six years old, they don't say weird shit like that, that anymore. It's just a memory that was inherited in some way we don't understand. That, yeah, that, I that, find that that's... more. Or it could be yeah. just be kids saying weird shit. Kids, kids saying weird shit. Kids, kids say weird shit right. all the time. <laughs> like they don't mean was, anything. My dad thought that shit was weird. He didn't think it was. He, he thought it might have been paranormal, but then as time went on, he didn't think it was paranormal. He thought the same thing that I just said, that, that I had somehow inherited a memory. Yeah. That's weird when you think about it. It is pretty but why, weird. But why animals might do it all the time, but they can't tell us. Yeah. You know. That's true. You know, so I think that's what it is. But yeah, so if you haven't seen this, I remember the book being really good. Um, I haven't uh, seen it in a, or haven't read it in a really long time. I think they, I think there was a... um a sequel to the book. I think that was called for the love of Audrey Rose or something like that. I think that came out in 1982. Um, also last, I read somewhere, I think it was on bloody disgusting or something like that. One of those horror blogs. They said in September of 2019, they were talking about doing a remake of Audrey Rose, which I thought might be kind of interesting. Cause like I said, you know, it's similar to the exorcism of Emily Rose, like where it's like part supernatural shit, part, courtroom drama like we're trying to prove in a court of law like a supernatural thing um so you know if they took it in that angle it might be interesting it's this is a very strange i don't know i have a lot of affection for this movie because i saw it so many times on cable when i was growing up and i really really liked the book um that i read when i was probably you know 11 12 years old and um but i would go into it not not expecting anything scary not expecting a horror movie you can see there's uh elements of the exorcist in it obviously there's elements of a lot of 70s paranormal type of stuff in it because that was like a very big thing at the time but it's kind of like more a drama but also that's trying to make you re believe reincarnation is real so it's just yeah. this very very odd uh, yeah, one thing I will complain about, it is a little bit too long. I think there's too many scenes of uh, Ivy freaking out and like yelling and whacking at windows with her hands and then Anthony Hopkins coming over and settling her down. I think they probably could have done like with one less of those scenes because it seems like there's a lot of that and it gets like repetitive. Also, I saw like another reviewer say that the uh, good drinking game in this would to be like every time Anthony Hopkins says, Audrey Rose, Audrey Rose, Audrey Rose, like you'd be fucking dead of liver failure before the end of the movie. But I mean, those are like minor, minor quibbles. Um, the little girl in this, a little bit weird looking, um, which, you know, not her fault, but she did a good job though, like acting. The acting in this is good, a little bit overwrought, but kind of the way that it was in a lot of those 70s kind of movies. This does take itself seriously. It is trying to make you convince you that reincarnation is real, but it's just a really interesting time capsule of the time period, I think. If to me, like you said, it has, it, it's strange tonally. It is very strange. It almost feels like, almost feels like a movie that would have been been made by a religious cult that believed in reincarnation. A little to, bit, yeah. To get you to believe it. It does have a little bit of that yeah. to it, and it has a little bit of a because it, it almost kind of has a little bit of a documentary feel to it in certain spot, certain spots, and it's almost kind of like it likes like they've shoehorned in some religion into it. Like yeah, or spirituality more than yeah, yeah. In a certain way. Easter, yeah, Easter, it is a little bit like that. You notice that? Yeah. It's, okay. Like it's Eastern like versus kind of, Western. Yeah, it's almost kind of like it's almost kind of like a a movie that Scientology would have made. But, <laughs> but, it, but, but, but you know what I mean about the whole track. Not as lame as that though. Yeah. Oh, they, it, it's been a lot worse. <laughs> But it, you this know, is actually a good movie. It was a kind of a movie that maybe Scientology would fantasize about making. Yeah. You know what I mean? If they had any talent. If they had any talent. <laughs> They'd be like, yeah, we need a movie that's kind of like The Exorcist, but it explains to people the whole track and how fucking, you know what I mean? How, you, you know, you can sign on to a billion year contract once you join the Sea Org. You'll be reborn many times and come back. 
You know what I mean? And it'll, it'll yeah. be great, and it'll compete with the Exorcist. We'll make all kinds of money, and then uh, we'll get a bunch of recruits. It seems like something like that. A little bit. It, little it definitely bit. does seem like. I don't. I don't know uh, a lot about Frank DeFolita as a person. Like I said, I've read some of his books. He's actually a really good uh, writer. You know, the the entity is very good. But he might believe in reincarnation. That's the thing. It's it really does seem to me that he yeah. does believe that it's real, yeah. or at least he did when this book was written and when this screenplay was written. And he's really trying to convince you. It's like you know all all this uh, you know Western stuff, all skepticism and science, and everything. That's kind of like oh, you're so closed minded. It's just, it has a little bit of that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, and a little bit of like kind of hippy dippy like eastern religions are way better kind of thing to well, it well there's something to be said for that too because look, science is nothing but just a constant series of corrections constantly correcting yourself it is just a tool yeah all right it's wrong it's always wrong because as time goes on that it, it's we what, find out more we shit. find out more shit so <laughs> in that way it was correct it's just uh there's not going to be any way with the technology you have now to prove that reincarnation happens or to prove in these other dimensions. Even though science postulates these other dimensions, you know, high, you know, higher dimensions in physics and shit like that. It's just that you can't access them. That's mathematical stuff that they're doing on paper. Yeah. You can't access it. It's in another dimension. It's like pointing to a direction that doesn't exist. Try it. Yeah. You can't point to it. Or describing a color that doesn't right. exist. Right, yeah, you can't. But on, maybe on... Maybe on paper you can do some math that says, that suggests that there's a bunch of higher dimensions, but I challenge you to send a probe to a higher dimension and get some pictures of it. <laughs> yeah. that well, it's another dimension. It's, another I mean, dimension. it's just outside of our yeah. of our ken of understanding. Yeah. I was just I was just reminded of when we were just talking about that. I was reminded of that very, very funny scene in this during the courtroom drama thing where they, you know, they had their witnesses come forward and like say all this stuff about like reincarnation and whatnot. And then the defense lawyer attorney is just kind of like, that's our case. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. that, like we proved reincarnation. Yeah, until... yeah, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> Even though like the, the evidence was a little flimsy, I, yeah. I have to say, but you know what I mean? It's a movie. It's but a yeah, story. like I said, if you're real, if you haven't seen this one, um, it does have kind of a cult following. Uh, and if you like kind of 70s movies, like I said, it's a little odd yeah. uh, and it wasn't as scary as I remembered it being. It's really yeah. not scary at all. Um, but it's really kind of an interesting, like I said, it's an interesting film from the time period. A little, It's kind of the same as some of the ones back then, but it also yeah. kind of had its own thing going on. If you on, haven't so. seen it, but you like The Exorcist and The Omen and this and that, it fits right in there. Yeah, you should definitely yeah. see that. It's on Shudder at the moment. Um, I think you can probably see it. It might be on 2B too, now that I'm thinking about yeah, it. But it yeah. reminds me a little bit of Altered States in a, in a weird way. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, and like I said, if you liked The it. Entity, which was yeah. the, you know, the same writer, then you would probably dig this as well. And it has like the a entity, sim entity and it has like a similar tonal shift, like in the yeah. middle so uh so yeah check it out like i said it's on shutter and uh we'll be back next week for another movie review and uh we'll see you later bye